question. What can campus leadership do to overcome those traditional departmental structures or territory perceived or real? Tom? Thank you. Uh, I think, first of all, you have to recognize that the concerns are there and the fears are there and they're real. Um, as a leader, I think, again, you, 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 you have to, I mean, we all know this, but you have to keep in your mind that uh, faculty are worried, rightly, about hiring and promotion and tenure. They're worried about um, what's going to happen in their department with respect to the number of majors they have, because that obviously impacts resources. And so if you're pulling people away to teach interdisciplinary activities and they're not able to teach in the department, then you know that has put the department at some risk. And obviously resources is a big concern. And so um, understanding that when you're going in uh, is important. Uh, because you, you, you need to uh, keep the context fresh in your mind as you're thinking of ways to deal with it. Uh, another, uh, another thing I did, and I'm, you need to understand not uh, from a background of higher education, and so uh, know nothing um, and have to learn everything. And so I started looking at the history at my institution. Um, and I want to read you something uh, that I found because I think it, is, it was very helpful, um, to me at least, as I thought through how we might proceed in our strategic planning efforts and to expand interdisciplinary work. And here it is. This, this is about a program that uh, was established as an interdisciplinary seminar at Davidson. And it was designed, uh, quote, to help the student, A, understand the total impact of modern industrial society and world affairs upon life. B, to tie together liberal arts education and discover the relevance of its insights for meeting the problems posed by today's world. And C, work out for himself, this is a time when Davidson was not co-ed, work out for himself his guiding worldview and sense of ethical responsibility. Now, anybody want to guess what year that was? 1955. Um, so interdisciplinary work at Davidson isn't new. And I think knowing that when you're entering into a process to try to expand it is very helpful because it allows you to refer not only to that but to the fact that uh, we have a program called the Humanities uh, Program which started in 1962 that's a, an interdisciplinary program. Uh, we started an honors college now known as the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies in 1970. Um, and so th there's a long history. In fact, there, the, pro the college acquired some property in 19. Uh, 73 uh, or somewhere in that era around uh, along the Rocky River in North Carolina and there was a very large-scale interdisciplinary effort led by faculty um, and the faculty came from biology chemistry philosophy history English and economics uh, again in the early 70s so it, I don't think our institutions that much different than others uh, in the sense that I suspect there's a history of interdisciplinary work on many campuses and understanding that when you go into uh, a new phase is helpful because it, it sometimes is good to remind people, look, we've done this before uh, and we've been able to deal with your fears and your concerns before, we can do it again. Uh, so I think that's, that's important. Um, I think letting people know you're not going to start out, and, and Professor Collins made this point last night, that you're not about trying to dismantle departments, that that's not your goal. You don't want to end all departments for all time, although some would argue it might be a good idea. Um, you know, that's not your purpose. Your purpose really is um, to think of new ways of, of teaching and learning. Uh, Mary made the point of transparency. I think that is critical transparency in the decision-making process. Uh, whatever that process is going to be, you need to be really clear with people from the beginning what it is and to the extent possible involve them in developing that decision-making process. So, for example, the guidelines and policies around hiring, promotion, and tenure, uh, obviously critical to uh, involve uh, people in, in developing those guidelines and policies. Uh, and it is, I think, critical that that part be done very early on in the process so that um, as you uh, become more serious about interdisciplinary hires and as you look at expanding interdisciplinary programs that the guidelines and policies uh, are clear. Uh, and that obviously is important to attract good people, but it's important uh, for faculty on campus to understand uh, how things are going to work in the future. You know, when it comes to, to resources, uh, I, I think the immediate 
uh, reaction is, particularly in economic times like now, uh, that it's a zero-sum game. That is, th the money's got to come from somewhere to make this work, so it's going to come from a department, or it's going to come from something in my budget, uh, it, whoever you are. That's your feeling. And so I think y you have to try to convince people, and it's hard in, in times like these, that money uh, will be added, that it won't always be a zero-sum game. That's not to say that it's all going to be additive, because I think a promise like that is short-sighted and unrealistic. Um, mm. There's definitely going to have to be some reprioritizing on most campuses. Uh, but I think there are new resources that can be acquired. Uh, and, um, you know, even in tough times, uh, we, we've been able to do that over the last couple of years, and I think other institutions have as well, uh, particularly for specific kinds of activities. And I'll, I'll share with you in a few minutes just a, a little bit of a, um, a case study that I think was helpful to us in, in, um, in, in sort of getting over the hump uh, toward interdisciplinary majors. But anyhow, I think helping people understand that it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. Um, the use of a strategic plan is, is also, I think, very, very helpful because it, uh, if it comes, particularly if the strategic plan itself is inclusive in its, in its development, um, you end up with buy-in, but you also, I think, uh, articulate clearly uh, why it's mission critical, why it's part of the priorities of the college, um, you set a clear direction, uh, you get buy-in not only from faculty, but from staff and trustees and alumni and others that are uh, involved with and understand your strategic plan. Uh, and that ultimately translates, at least in my experience, uh, into donor support sometimes for specific new activities. And let me then turn to, to one at Davidson. Um, when I came to Davidson, uh, though we had this long history of interdisciplinary work, uh, we had no interdisciplinary majors. Uh, it, it had been uh, uh, something that was just resisted by the faculty, uh, I think in part out of fear that interdisciplinary majors somehow lacked rigor, uh, and Davidson's into rigor. Uh, as a graduate of that institution, I can assure you they're into rigor, uh, <laughs> and, and it's a good thing. But, um, you know, I think there was a fear sort of of going, we had interdisciplinary concentrations and we had this interdisciplinary history, but no majors. The strategic plan said, we're going to have interdisciplinary majors. Uh, so the, 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 the direction was clear. So now how do you get there? Um, and I think one that was obvious to me, I, I ran a foundation before I came to Davis and we did a lot of environmental work. It was clear environmental uh, uh, studies is an area that we needed desperately and that I think everybody needs, one of the most critical problems facing the world. So as soon as I came, we started campus-wide efforts around sustainability right, to try to raise awareness of the importance, and people begin to see that it is not within one discipline, that it's across disciplines, and this was all extracurricular or co-curricular activity, um, but it helped create an environment in which there was an interest uh, in, in uh, sustainability and environmental studies. Uh, it worked its way into our strategic plan, oddly enough, uh, and um, and then we had, we, we were able to attract some donors who were really interested in the environment. Uh, again, not uncommon, there are lots of them out there, but who wanted specifically to jumpstart uh, some more work at Davidson around environmental studies. And so uh, wanted to fund a, a faculty position, an endowed position, um, uh, in some field, some discipline that related to the environment. Uh, and so uh, getting those resources, naming somebody to that position, uh, then creating a director of environmental studies uh, and putting that person in, in that position, all that designed to try to jumpstart uh, a program and ultimately a major. Well, meanwhile, Tom, we looked at, yeah, and I'm gonna, it, I'll be finished just one second. <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, we looked at this policy You can tell he's stuff. excited about his interdisciplinary program. Yeah, no, but I think this is, this is uh, I'm still within my five minutes, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyhow, we, we looked at, the meanwhile, the policy, so we knew how to go about hiring uh, new faculty, and we knew what the rules were. And so then we were able to go out and get even more resources uh, to hire additional positions and to convince departments to hire new people that had uh, the ability to also teach in the environmental studies. Uh, and we rewarded, rewarded those departments uh, with new searches uh, that in order to be able to make that happen. So I think 
the, the use of resources in a targeted way, but to doing it with a plan from the beginning of what you're trying to accomplish really worked. And then last spring, um, the faculty passed environmental studies as our first interdisciplinary major. So uh, I think with the, again, with, a, with a, a thoughtful plan and using some of the techniques that Mary already outlined, you can make it happen. 